All right, so here we go. This is the first six weeks preview. This is the one we started yesterday. We on the test every six weeks? Yep. Really? Yep. So, does that mean we still have to pass test? Oh, my God. Uh, Somebody do, yeah. You know, that was just recording. Here we go. Number one. For number one, they want us to write a new equation. If we were to shift y equals negative 3x squared, 8 units to the right. So, here we go. First of all, we do need a y equals. I know some of you guys are leaving off the y equals. That's important. Or f of x. But you do need one or the other. The negative 3 is going to stay. We're not changing that. What we're doing is we want to move this thing to the right. And if I want to move my graph to the right, according to our notes here, it says that we've got to subtract inside the parentheses. In this case, we're going to subtract 8. So we should have x minus 8. And don't forget the square should be on the outside. And so the equation I'm looking for is y equals negative 3 x minus 8 squared. And if it doesn't look exactly like that on the test, we will be another problem. Now the good thing is, just remember, the good thing is the test is actually multiple choice. So you will have some choices to go on. It's going to be for every kid. Alright. That's number one. Number two. Number two, you're asked to find the domain of the graph y equals 2 square root of x plus 3 minus 5. Now the first thing we need to do is go ahead and take a look at the graph. Now I'm going to go ahead and use what I know about transformation to get my graph, but you could also use your calculator. Here's what I know. I know that the plus 3 moves my graph 3 units to the left. I know the minus 5 moves the graph down 5 units. And I know that 2 stretches it out vertically. So basically what I'm looking at is the graph that looks something like this right here. Remember I moved it over 3 units and I also moved it down 5 units. So the question was, what is the domain? What are the x values on this graph? Well, if I start here, that x value right there is a negative 3. This x value is negative 2. This x value is negative 1. This x value is 0. This x value is 1. This is 2. This is 3. 4, and so on and so on. So what's happening to those x values? Are they getting larger or are they getting smaller? Larger. They're getting larger. So therefore, the x values are greater than or equal to our negative 3. So this is the domain of this graph. I, I, could, I could also ask you for the range. So keep that in mind. I could also ask you for the range. Now be careful. If you are going to use your calculator, when you type this in, you need to be extra, extra careful to make sure it's only the x plus 3 underneath the square root. It's real hard to tell. Some of you leave everything underneath the square root. So be extremely, extremely careful. All right, let's go on to the next one here. This is a big one. They ask you to list all the characteristics of the seven parent function. So what I'm looking for is, do you remember what each of the graphs look like? So let's go ahead and go through the graphs first. Linear, of course, is a line. Quadratic is the one that looks like a U-shape. Absolute value, what does that one look like? A V-shape. Then we had exponential. Now there's two different exponentials. We've got one that increases, and we also have one that decreases. We've got two different exponentials. Exponential growth and an exponential decay. Rational. What does a rational look like? Two what? Two parts, two branches. What we have is a curve in the first quadrant and another curve over here in the third quadrant. Log. What does the graph of log look like? That one that curves starts down here in the fourth quadrant and curves into the first quadrant. And then the last one, the square root. Square root starts here at the origin and curves in the first quadrant. So make sure you know what each of these graphs look like. Not only do you have to know what the graphs look like, you're also going to have to know what each of the equations are. So for linear, the equation is y equals what? x. For quadratic, it's y equals x squared. Absolute value, the equation is y equals absolute value of x. Exponential, we have y equals b to the x power. Of course, b could be any value. 
depending on what that value is, will determine whether it's increasing or decreasing. Rational. The equation for a rational is 1 over x. Then we got the log, which is y equals log of x. And finally, the square roots is the square root of x, which is why they call it the square root function. So make sure not only do you know what the graphs look like, make sure you also know the, uh, the equations for each of these graphs. You're also going to need to know the domain and the range of each of these graphs as well. Domain. Let's go with domain. Domain of our linear parent function. Anybody got that one written down? All real numbers. Let's talk about the domain on our quadratic here. What's the domain on the quadratic? Same thing. All real numbers. Absolute value. The domain on that one is all real numbers. Over here on our exponential, the domain. What are the x values on that graph? All real numbers. Rational. Be careful here. The rational. What are the x values on this graph? Everything except for zero. What we're going to do is we're going to say everything except for 0. We're going to do this right here. All of the x's except for 0. Uh, log. The domain on our log is not all real numbers. Take a look at the graph there. Notice we don't have any x values to the left of our y-axis. The graph stays on the right side of the y-axis. Alright, you're close. The x values are greater than 0. Not equal to, because this graph runs up right against that line, but it never actually equals to this is greater than No. No. So we also have like 0 0.5, 0 0.4. Uh, the next one here is square roots. We're looking at the domain of our square roots. Again, look at the graph. Notice how it starts at the origin. And it goes to the right. And we're talking about just positive x values. So what are we going to say here? X is greater than or equal to our zero. Notice this time I can include the zero. That's because it starts right at the origin. All right, so there's your domain. Finally, we're also going to need to know the range of each of these graphs. So if you look at our linear parent function, the range here is going to be all real numbers. The range on our quadratic, notice how the graph stays above the x-axis, so we're only looking at positive y values. So the range on this one would be y is greater than or equal to zero. Over here on our absolute value, notice it's very similar to our quadratic. The y values are also greater than or equal to zero. It all stays above the x-axis, which that's the positive y values. Our exponential, what kind of range do we have on our exponential? What kind of y values do we have there? Y is greater than 0. Now, how come we're not going to put the equal sign on this one? That's right. It doesn't touch the x-axis. It runs right against it, but it never actually touches it. So we don't need to do that. Over here in our rational, our range is going to be very similar to our domain. We're including all the y values except for one number. The one number we're not going to have here is 0. So the range is everything except for 0. Our log. The range for our log, remember the graph does start down here in the fourth quadrant, and then it curves into the first quadrant. So what kind of range do I have here? Starts down at the bottom and goes up to the top. What's that? All real numbers. Very good. We're using all the negative numbers and all the positive. In both the first, uh, first and fourth block. And finally, for our square roots, for our square root, our range, the y values. Again, notice how the graph stays above the x axis. So we have what kind of y values here? Y is greater than or equal to a. And we do include the zero because remember we did start at the order. All right, so that one question has a lot of information that we got to remember for this test. Mm -hmm.
All right, let's go to the next one, number four. They want me to write an equation that describes a horizontal translation of negative three units, a vertical translation of four units, and also a reflection over the y-axis, and a vertical stretch of two. And of course, we're applying this to our quadratic parent function. First of all, this is our quadratic parent function. You don't know that already. So we're going to perform these transformations to that quadratic. So I'm going to start with the horizontal change. In this case, the horizontal translation we're talking about is negative 3 units. So inside the parentheses, we're going to do x minus 3. Minus 3 because it's negative 3 units. Then I'm going to go to my vertical translation, the up and down. That goes on the outside of the parentheses. And how many units am I moving there? Four. Four. And that's a positive four, so we're going to use a plus four. It also goes on to say that we're going to have a reflection over the y-axis. So if I want a reflection over the y-axis, I need a negative sign. However, where does that negative sign need to be? Okay. Inside the parentheses, right next to the x. So that's where I'm going to put my. And finally, I need to do a vertical stretch of 2. So that 2 needs to be out here in front of your parentheses. If it says the horizontal transition is negative 2 units, what are they going to point backwards? Well, they're, they're just using the, the value there. So they're not that. talking about the graph actually moving, moving back. They didn't say left, they didn't say right, they just said negative 3. That's what we said. Now, the uh, question could say, and I think we saw that already, it could say move left, move right. And in that case, you want to do exactly what it says. But in this case, they didn't specify how to right. They just said negative three units. So yeah. you just use their value. All right, we're on the next page, number five. They wanted to define a function. At this point, we should all know what a function is. It's a set of ordered pairs. But what's special about this order pair? X's don't repeat. X's don't repeat. Right, so in order to be a function, X cannot be repeated. Now in this particular case, I asked you for a definition, but on the actual test, I may give you an example. I may ask you, is this a function? So you're going to be looking for if the X's are repeated. All right, number six, it says here that Jake averages 20 points per game when he plays basketball. What is the functional relationship between the total number of points that he scores and the number of games that he plays? So basically what I'm looking for here is a dependency state. One thing depends on the uh, The question is, what depends on what? Okay, so it's the total number of points. And those total number of points are going to depend, what do they depend on? They depend on the number of games. In other words, if he only plays one game, he's going to get a certain number of points. But if he plays two games, well, then he's going to get more points. If he plays three games, well, then he'll get even more points. So the more games he plays, the more points he scores. So the number of points he makes is going to depend on the number of games. All the number of points depend on the number of games. All right, number seven, we kind of did this already. We want to uh, get a rough sketch of each of these parent functions. So let's do this real quick again. Yeah. First of all, linear, so that's our line, this is linear. Quadratic, quadratic is the one that looks like a U shape. Absolute value, that's the V. Uh, what's next? Exponential. Don't forget there are two different exponentials. We do have one that increases, and we also have one that decreases. Exponential growth and exponential decay. We also have the rational. Rational is the one that has the two parts. Logarithmic function. Again, that's the one that starts down here in the fourth quadrant. 
turns it into the first quadrant. And finally, your square root is the one that starts at the origin and curves to the right. Now, guys, we'll be seeing these uh, parent functions throughout the year. So it's important if you still don't have that, <coughs> we're going to get that. So we're going to see that quite a bit throughout the year. All right, here we go. Number eight. It says that a swimming pool company made a scatter plot to show the number of pool sales per year by a salesperson with X years of experience. If a bonus is earned when 40 or more pools are sold in one year, how might a, how long might it, a beginning salesman expect to work before earning a bonus? So if we look at the graph here, we can see that the X values represent the number of years of experience. The Y values represent the number of pools sold. So for example, basically what we see here is if we have one year of experience, we can expect the number of pools sold to be about what? What would you say there? 15. By the way, what are they counting by here? Are you sure? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. So they're counting by tenths. So again, if we're talking one year experience about how many pools are going to be sold there? About 15. If we've got three years of experience, we're talking about how many pools being sold? 29. About 29, 30, somewhere around there. Our question is, uh, if there's 40 pools sold, how many years experience are we looking at? Well, let's find 40. Right? It was 40, right? Uh, yeah, 40. So here's 40. So we're looking somewhere in this area here. If we follow this pattern, we can expect this person to have about, what would you say, number of years of experience? Four. Somewhere in the range of four. four. Oh. Is that exact? No, but it is pretty close. Right? About four years. What's that? Four years. Four. Four years. Four years. Four Well, that should have been a freebie there on number nine. Number nine says, what is the domain of this function represented by the order pairs in the table? First of all, the word domain. At this point, everybody should know the word domain means x. So what are the x values in this table here? Well, there's a 1, a 3, a 6, and a 7. Of course, I could also change this and ask you for the range. Oh. And if I ask you for the range, what am I asking for this time? Two, six, seven, three. Two, six, seven, three. So y values. No, that's not what I have here. All I have are four numbers, four x values. Those are the only four x values I want. Yeah, notice some of you saying uh, greater than 1 or something like that. That is not true. You don't see a 2 in there. You don't see an 8 in there. So no, it's got to be 1, 3, 6, and 7. Just those values. All right, we're on number 10. Uh, number 10, it says if the x in a rational parent function, so let me go ahead and put that here. We're talking a rational parent function. There it is. That's the rational parent function. If the x is replaced with x minus 8, how is the graph going to change? In other words, if I go from that to that, what would that do to the graph? What is the minus 8? In this case, it's going to move it to the right. How many times is it going to move it to the right? 8 units. Basically, all we're doing is what we have right over here. Thank you. All right, number 11. Given the function f of x is equal to negative 5 plus 3x, they wanted to find f of 2. Another freebie here. All we're simply doing is replacing x with the value they give you, which in this case is going to be the 2. All I did was replace x with 2. 
From there, you can either do this in your head or you can put it in the calculator. So what is a negative 5 plus 3 times 2? 1. Now, don't, don't forget, guys, there was two different ways, or two different notations that I said we can write the answer for. This wasn't one of them. We said we could do f of 2 equals 1. So I could put it on the test in that format. What else could I do? An order pair. And that order pair would be 2, 1. 2 is the x value, 1 is the y value. Number 12, you have to fill in a couple of blanks. Number 12, it says that the graph of a function and its blank are reflections with respect to what? Did anybody manage to figure out the two blanks there? Inverse is the first blank. Inverse. And it's a reflection respect to, uh, with respect to what line? Y equals X. It's that linear parent function that we have that reflection. Don't forget, y equals x is where the reflection occurs when we're talking inverse. Not over the x-axis, not over the y-axis. Alright, now let's take a look at a couple of uh, examples of finding that inverse. A says f of x is equal to 3x minus 4. We want to find the inverse. Don't forget, guys, f of x is the equivalent of a y. So this is the same thing as saying y equals 3x minus 4. So if I want to find the inverse, the first thing I'm going to need to do is switch the x and the y. So now I'm going to have an equation y, uh, x equals 3y minus 4. At this point, I need to solve that equation for y. So the first thing I'm going to do is add 4, which means now I have x plus 4 is equal to a 3y. That's not it. That's not the answer. I've still got one other thing to do. And what is that? Divide by 3. So we're going to divide this by 3 and this by 3. Now I'll give you a little heads up here. I could uh, write the answer a couple of different ways here. I could leave it y equals x plus 4 divided by 3. That's one way I could do it. Or I could actually take each of these values and divide it by 3. For example, the value or the number in front of the x. There is a number in front of the x, you just can't see it. What is it? 1. So if I divide 1 by 3, I get a 1 third. Then I would do the same thing with the 4. 4 divided by 3. 4 divided by 3 would be a 1 point, what? 1.333. Or I can write it as a fraction as well. So there's a couple of different options. And I'm not sure which one you're going to see on the test. So just make sure you can do it both ways. We can do it like this, or we can go the extra step and actually take each of the values and divide them by three. So just be ready for both. All right, B, same idea. We're going to take the X and Y, we're going to switch them. That's the first thing we need to do when we're working with our inverses. And then from here, we're just solving for the Y. So the first thing I'm going to do is add 3. So now i got x plus 3 is equal to 2y. Two then what I'm going to do is divide by 2. So again, just like the first one here, I can have this written two different ways. I can do x plus 3 over 2. That would be one way. That would be acceptable. Or I could actually divide each of the values by 2. So again, there's a 1 in front of the x, so 1 divided by 2 would be 1 half. 3 divided by 2 would be a 3 halves. So either one of those could show up on the, uh, on the test. C, remember that g of x is the equivalent of a y, same thing. If I want to find the inverse, the first thing I'm going to have to do is switch the x and the y. So now I've got x is equal to 3y plus 2. And I'm solving for the y. We're going to start by subtracting 2. So we've got x minus 2 is equal to 3y. 
then divide it by three. Don't forget on the test, we could see it written one of two ways. I could see it written as x minus two divided by three. That's one way. Or I could take each of the values and divide it by three. So the one divided by three would be one third. Two divided by three would be two thirds. So either one of those would be acceptable. All right, the last one, I'm running out of room, so I'll bring it up here. Stop. First thing I'm going to do is switch the x to y. So I've got x is equal to y minus 4 divided by 5. Now I need to solve for the y. All right, so let's see. Anybody do this one? What did you do first? All right, well, since they're dividing by 5, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to multiply both sides by 5. This way, we can cancel those out. So now we have 5x is equal to y minus 4. But that's not the answer just yet. I've still got one other thing to do. And what is that? Add 4. All right, so if I add 4, now what I end up with is 5x plus 4 is equal to y. Which, of course, would be the same thing as y equals 5x and only one way to write the answer there. All right, so that takes us through the inverse. You will definitely see an inverse on the check. Okay. Next one, which of the following points would lie on the inverse of this graph? Well, first of all, you'll notice that they got a couple of points on this graph highlighted. So what I'm going to do is out to the side, I'm going to go ahead and identify each of these points. Starting around here, what is that point? What is that ordered pair? Five. Five, what? Five. five. So that ordered pair right there is five, five. What about that ordered pair? That ordered pair is four. About that point, what is that order pair? One, three. This order pair right here is two. This order pair right here is four, or is it four or five? Five, one. So, what I have written down is these five points. Now, the question was which of the following points would lie on the inverse? Now, remember, this is going to be multiple choice here. So when I say inverse, what are we supposed to do with the x and y value on inverses? So one of those points could be 5, 5, which is the inverse of these two right here. What would be the inverse of 2, 4? So that would be another option. The inverse of 1, 3 would be 3, 1. The inverse of 2, 2 would be 2. And finally, the inverse of 5, 1 would be one five. So any of these are possibilities for being inverses of one of these points. So remember, inverse is just switching the x and the y. So if you didn't have any trouble with 15, we really shouldn't have any trouble with 16. On 16, they ask, what is the inverse of 13? Negative 3.5. Well, again, inverse is just switching the x and the y. So if I switch those two numbers, now I have negative 3.5 and 13. There's the inverse. That's another freebie there. And finally, number 19, how does the absolute value transform various parent functions? So just a couple of examples here. Here's some parent functions. What two parent functions did I just write on the board? Linear and quadratic. They're asking me, what if, what if I take those parent functions and put absolute values around each of those parent functions? What would happen to their graphs? Well, this is one of our transformation guys. Remember, one of those in our notes is the function with the absolute value around, which is what we're looking at here. So what if we say, 
right over here in yellow. Actually, it's this one right here. It says that one and quadrant two, make sure I get this right, one and two are going to stay the same. Quadrants one and two stay the same. So in other words, whatever you see in quadrants one and two, you're not going to change that. The A is the same. But everything that you see in quadrants three and four, what's going to happen with those? There it is. It's going to reflect over the x-axis. This is what we're going to see, regardless of what the parent function is, if we put the absolute value around that parent function. All right, so that's going to take us through our uh, review.